Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it's time for some really cool knife nerdery. Today we're opening up a package that came my way directly from NAFS. Now that in and of itself was a surprise to me. I was expecting this to come from Urban ADC because what's inside here is an exclusive premium version of the NAFS Lander that Ben is doing in partnership with Urban ADC. It's going to be coming out this Wednesday as part of their gear drop. I'll have a link down below. If you use that link to buy this or anything else from the website, I'll get a small commission that helps out the channel. Never required, but I really appreciate it. Anyway, uh, yeah, so... The fact that this is coming directly from NAFS instead implies that Ben Peterson at least a little bit knows that I exist. And that is such a surreal thing to be able to say. I know this is kind of a silly thing to get excited by, but like... I've been a huge fan of Ben's for a really long time. I kind of feel like I grew up watching Ben, even though he and I are probably the same age, but I kind of like came into the knife hobby, like a lot of people, by watching Ben's videos at Blade HQ. If you don't know who Ben is, we'll talk all about that more in a moment, but let's just get this open so that you guys can at least see the knife while I'm rambling. To open it, of course, I'm going to use a Ben Peterson design. This is the Baby Banter, and if you're in the market for a fifth pocket knife, and if you're anywhere close to the budget range, this is the single best budgety fifth pocket knife of all time. It punches way above its price point and I adore this knife. Okay, let's get this open. Oh, there's more in here than I expected. Okay, <laughs> what is this? These are floaties? <laughs> sure, okay. Um, what can I do with these? Well, so here's a, a fun fact. I'm not a very good swimmer. Uh, so maybe I will actually just use these. These are hilarious. Ben is such a great, uh, weird sense of humor type of person. Uh, this is delightful. <laughs> okay, let's open up this knife. Naps. Pause for some you know, information here. That's cool that he provides all of this information. He's being educational here on the back. That's one of the things I also love about him. He has these uh, posters and, and like disassembly mats you can get that have uh, like a bunch of different schematic stuff on them that just kind of explain knife concepts to people. A lot of people have learned knives by watching Ben. And so it's one of the many reasons why I think he's just an awesome person. Okay, so let's see what's inside here. <laughs> Right, so you know that if this is going to be a partnership with Urban EDC, it's going to be Sagai, huh? <laughs> okay, candy going along with the summer theme. I don't even know what I'm looking at. Brine, shrimp, eggs, and salt? Freshly hatched brine shrimp are an excellent food for baby fish. So this is f fish food? No, I guess. Yeah, I guess this is a way of growing your own fish food? Not for human consumption. I don't know. <laughs> Again, delightfully weird. Ah, these are sea monkeys. Okay, quick update. So I filmed this entire video thinking this was just a standard loaner and then I was going back when I was done. But it turns out that this was actually a gift from Urban EDC and Ben Peterson. And that is... I, <laughs> that's just so freaking cool. I am so honored. I am I'm floored. Uh, this is going to hold a special place in my collection. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is so freaking cool. Okay, let's check out the knife itself. NAFS, in collaboration with Urban EDC. Love it. <laughs> Even more branding. We've got some more information here. You can pause to read this, but if you read this, what it's talking about here is where he's getting the lander name from. It's coming from a moon lander theme, which makes a lot of sense. He's got the whole space kitty thing going on. Fun fact, I've met Buzz Aldrin. And we also have some information here on how to close your knife. This is interesting. Like one of the one of the videos that Ben put out recently uh, in collaboration with Zach, they got back together from the Blade HQ days. And they, they went around and asking people if they know how to close a knife or like trying to get them to see if they can close a knife. And a lot of people did not understand liner locks. And so this makes, if you're a knife person, it's gonna seem immediately intuitive to you how to close this. But if you're not, it's good to include this. So this would actually be uh, great for this is like a first knife gift for someone else. Like if you're trying to get someone else into the hobby with you. What else do we got on here? Ah, we'll talk all about the scale swappery in a moment. Got a cool schematic of the knife itself and some maintenance tips. One thing that's actually really useful is that he's saying that the factory grind angle is 20 degrees. Now, odds are, depending on how you're sharpening, you might have to adjust slightly up or down anyway, and so using a Sharpie trick to figure it out, but knowing that you are, that you're aiming for 20 degrees as a starting point, that's gonna really save you some time. Okay, let's finally look at the knives. Okay, 
This is the lander. And if you were to get the lander normally, it would come in either flat G10 and D2, or contoured micarta and 14C28N. But this version is coming in contoured G10 and M390. And you're getting, because of course, Urban EDC, a pair of Sagaiha, I don't know if this is milled or lasered or however they're doing it, but this is 3D textured Sagaiha scales, and they are so cool looking. Okay. You also get a free set of extra screws. This is great for a lot of reasons. Just in general, people should get clued to extra screws. But I also remember hearing in Shabazz's review of these, of the knife, that the screws were kind of soft on his. I don't know if these are updated new screws or just another set of those, but it's great that they're including them. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, I love this size. So this is the baby banter. I unfortunately don't have a full size banter here to compare, but yeah, this is, uh, going to be, I think this is a 2.75 inch blade, so this is still a small knife, but you can see that it's much bigger than the baby banter. So this is probably going to be a full four finger grip for most people. How's our detent on this? Ooh, that's pretty snappy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's delightful. Yeah, that feels good. <laughs> that is so... Okay, one of the reasons why I absolutely adore the baby banter is that Civivi nailed the detent on this. The pop open on this is so dang good. It feels fantastic, whether you're doing reverse flick or with a thumb, it's just perfect. It feels like a wonderful, wonderful snap into place. It's authoritative despite how small this is. And so finding out that this is doing, <laughs> that's an even stronger snap, wow. Okay, I said I'd talk about who Ben Peterson is if somehow you don't know. Uh, you might know him as Ben Banters because yes, he is the knife banters guy. He is the what is up guys guy. What is <laughs> guys? He is the person that made Blade HQ kind of as famous as they are and why they're so successful on YouTube. Now it's funny because Ben Peterson, he's a marketing guy, but he was never like an on-camera marketing guy. And he got into the role of being the YouTube face for Blade HQ kind of just by luck slash necessity. They needed someone to do it. And he's talked many times in a lot of interviews about how he felt pretty uncomfortable doing that at first. And he just never, was never really his plan, but he is, he is just such a magnetic personality. He just exudes such warmth and he's such just like a, a charming, pleasant person <laughs> that he was the perfect choice for the job. And that knife banter video series that they started and that lasted many, many years, that is, like I said, that's how myself and a lot of people got into this hobby. Is It was just the perfect level of fun and informational and lighthearted and silly and welcoming. You didn't have to feel like you already understood everything. And it just seemed like fun, cool people that you'd want to hang out with. When he eventually left Blade HQ, he brought a big following with him still, because like I said, he became kind of a beloved celebrity in the knife market. And so when he started designing his own knives, things like the banter, then the baby banter, and then the big banter, th those are done through Wii and Civivi. They were really popular, partly because they're just excellent like non-threatening functional tool style knives, but also they're really popular because people just kind of love Ben. And so when he started having his own knives under his own brand, NAFs, people were really, really excited to see how they turn out. Like I said in the past, he did things through Civivi and Wii, and Civivi and Wii have fantastic quality control. They make just excellent knives especially in that budget space, but their prices have been coming up and up more. They introduced Sencut, which is now like the new budget version. And so there's definitely some big shoes to fill for his own in-house brand knives. Now these are made by QSP and I've experienced QSP plenty of times. And on their budget space, things like the QSP produced Kvist Bladeworks variant. I love this knife. One of the things that's great about it is that QSP absolutely nailed this knife. It is just spectacular. And so I know that they're capable of making fantastic things even on the budget space. Now, if you watch Shabazz's video on this, he said that one of the things that he experienced is that it felt kind of like it had been attacked by the cost-saving vampires or something, some, some delightful phrasing like that. Basically, that it felt like all everywhere where they could cut costs that they had. And so that's one of the things that makes this so exciting here today, because this is a premium version version done, like I said, in M390 blade steel. And it has the newer contoured style handles, which, ugh, I love a good contoured handle. 
Okay, let's actually start taking a look at this knife finally. We've got a 2.75 inch blade. The blade stock is 0.1 inches. So it's not like absurdly thin, but this is a thin blade stock. And so even though this isn't a crazy tall blade, I think this is going to have good slicing geometry. And it looks like it's getting pretty decently thin behind the edge. Yeah, by my just kind of eye calipers, that looks like it's maybe like 18 thousandths. Let's measure real quick and find out. Yep. <laughs> so that's cool to see. Also, oh yeah, they did the plunge grind nice on this. And that's something that Nick said in his video that they kind of messed up, but you can see that the plunge on this version at least is a very clean drop off, that there is very little bit of a swoop there at all. And okay, well here, how about this? So there is, I'm noticing a very slight amount of recurve right here at the end where the blade's coming right back out a little bit. But I don't think that's actually because of the plunge. I think it's just how they're sharpening it. Because if you're actually looking at where this plunge is coming in, yeah, that's a really steep drop off. So I'm not really sure why it's showing up like that. But it is worth noting that while the plunge is done great, there is basically no sharpening toil here. You've got this tiny little of distance right here before you're going to start hitting a smile. Although honestly, because the plunge is done the way it is, it's not gonna be so much a smile. You're gonna treat it the way you would with something like Spyderco knives, where you're just gonna sharpen up to that point and just treat it like a wall. This blade shape is one that's meant to be just like a kind of all arounder. Now that's something in common with his previous knives. They have these unassuming and non-threatening blade shapes that you could easily take out in a lunchroom and no one's going to think that you have some kind of crazy attack plan in mind. But they're also built just for like a functional everyday use case. And so what we have here is a lot of flat and then a good amount of belly, but a low down enough tip. And that's important because the tip being lower like this means that it's not hard to rotate your hand up to be able to get access to that tip. If the tip is much higher on the knife, you have to rotate your wrist much more in order to try and cut with that. So while this is not going to work as well as like a Warren Cliff or Sheep's Foot, this is the kind of thing that you still easily can get to that tip for utility cuts. Meanwhile, that belly is gonna allow you to do kind of drawing, rocking cuts. So it's just gonna be a lot more versatile and you're gonna be able to use much more points of contact on this. So if you are the type of person that wants to open packages all day, you can get in there with a tip or you can just cut with this portion here and you can cut sometimes there, sometimes there, sometimes there and stretch out that lifespan of that edge. Let's look at the edge up here. Okay, yeah, so we've got enough meat all the way up here that this does not look dainty at all, but if you come down to the edge, that's pretty good and precise. I think you're gonna be able to get some pretty good precise utility cuts if you're trying to cut around a shape or get into a little nook and cranny. So this feels like it's going to be a very functional blade shape. And that's something that I really loved about the baby banter is that this is just a great all-arounder. I use this all the time for just little things around the house and it is perfect for my kind of EDC. I think this is gonna meet that same kind of needs for a lot of people. And being 2.75 inches, this is the kind of thing where this is now legal almost everywhere. Some places have a full uh, a two and a half inch mark and then you're gonna need something like the baby banter. But this is the kind of thing that you're gonna be able to bring just about anywhere you're allowed to have a locking knife. Has this feel in hand? Yeah, okay. That's delightful. Now the baby banter pulls off a four finger grip by having this choil. But even in my hands, I wear medium sized gloves. This is about the limit. And moving over here, that feels great. And you can see that I even have a little bit of room right here. So if you have much wider hands, you could sprawl out. And he does this thing on a lot of his knives. He said he, he uh, was inspired from kitchen knives where you have a little notch back here. And what that means is if you do spill over, you can kind of hug onto this last bit without feeling like you have a pointy thing jabbing into your finger. So in my medium glove size hands, I have plenty of room. I think I could even spread out a little bit. Yeah, and it still fits great. Let's see, how much do I feel this clip? Eh, I do feel it. It's a similar style to what you have here on the banter. It's a little bit wider. And they're never my favorite kind of clips because they just come up at the end. There's no like flattened spot here. Now in my particular hands where this is hitting is in a good spot. This is hitting back here behind this line here. I, I personally find that if the tip of the clip is landing in this zone right here, I tend not to feel it that much. If it's sticking out here into this part, this is technically called the first interdigital volar pad, big nerdery. Anyway, if it, if it ends here, I tend to feel it. If it ends here, I tend not to. And this one is landing right along that line for me. And so I don't actually notice this that much. I think if I was holding this, if I was like really, if this was like wiggling back and forth a lot in my hand, yeah. So I, I think if I was doing the kind of cutting where this is kind of shifting in my hand a lot, I would start to feel this kind of rubbing. 
And so it's not my favorite clip, but I honestly, it's not a, it's not really a hotspot for me. They've done a really nice job chamfering off these corners. Like it's just this tiniest little line right there. It's not like a full on chamfer, but they've just knocked this off enough. You can see that little corner glowing right there. And so while, you know, this isn't kind of thing you're going to use to strike a fire stick then as a result. But but for most people's EDC, this is exactly what you want where it's comfortable and doesn't feel scrapey and scratchy at all if you're trying to put your finger in the back. And this is a thick enough blade stock that it feels quite comfortable. Put a good amount of force on this. Yeah, you can really push down on that. In general, something this is really excelling at. So on like the baby banter, this is effectively perfectly straight across. And it does curl back here in a way that that doesn't feel bad pushing into the back of my hand. But you can see that it leaves a little tiny gap right there because there's it's just straight. So that's something I'm really pleased to see here that this curves down in a way that fits my hand really, really nicely. And so in a pinch grip, this feels very ergonomic. Let's see, how is the lock bar done? Okay, so this is fully nested liners here. I'm assuming these are steel liners, they must be. Let me grab something magnetic. Yep. <laughs> But they are fully nested inside, which means that the handles here wrap around on the top. And I personally like this so much more than if you just have kind of slab sandwich style construction. For one reason, I just think it's aesthetically prettier. But for another reason, it means that you don't have any kind of corners or edges that you can catch on and that it just makes it a little bit more comfortable. So it's like aesthetically and physically just an improvement. And this is the style where only the front little bit right here is exposed. Pair that over here to like the baby banter. Now this is uh, just a different kind of construction in general, but you can see that this entire front part is exposed. On the back, it's nested, but on the front, is exposed. And so this is the kind of thing where there's like a little bit of gap right here. So you can get kind of crud in here. Or you can also just slightly pinch yourself if you do it just wrong. The biggest thing is for me, like aesthetically, I just think this looks a little bit uglier. Whereas having just this front part exposed means that you have plenty of space to push over on it, but the rest of it is hidden down below. How we got on lock bar axis? We've got a little chamfer right here, like a little kind of almost scallop spot removed. Looks like there is a chamfer right here. Now this kind of jimping, this is the kind of jimping that I don't really love to see on lock bars because it's rounded enough that I don't think it actually provides meaningful grip. I just find it a little bit uncomfortable. The jimping over here, this is fantastic. So you can see that it's only cut in at the side. So if you come down from a top, you're pushing on a flat surface and it's crisp enough on the edges that it does absolutely catch your finger. And so this is the kind of lock bar jimping. If, if you're going to put lock bar jimping, I don't think you should have lock bar jimping, period. But if you're going to have lock bar jimping, I think this style works really, really well. And this style, this reminds me more of the kind of things you find on something like the original Svivi Elementum. And this is just like, I, I, I would much rather this style of jimping just not exist at all. But do I find this uncomfortable? Not really. I can push it over just fine. I have small enough fingers, like my fingers are just slender enough, I don't have giant sausage fingers, that I don't have any trouble pushing this over. And you can see that it's recessed on the front scale, so you do have access to this part right here from the side, but this is a pretty narrow spot. So I think that if you have much thicker hands than me, you might have a little bit of difficulty getting in here, but I'm not finding any problem. Also, this is, like I said, a pretty small knife. So it might be the kind of thing where if you have giant hands, you just wouldn't be picking this up in the first place. Oh, I just noticed that this clip is fully recessed. Oh, that's really nicely done. So what we're talking about here is the fact that the there's been a like a milled out spot for the clip to sit into, and then the screws themselves are countersunk. And so they're sitting flush in that clip spot too. And so there's this full space here to slide into your pocket. There's nothing to kind of snag your pocket on. And over here, you can see they did that exact same thing on the baby banter. But comparison, this like QSP made this variant PE, you can see the screw stick up just slightly. And so while this is perfectly fine, you technically do have less space at the very top. So if you have thicker pants, you can snag just a tiniest bit. And over here, they've done it perfectly where there's absolutely no opportunity to snag whatsoever. They're also doing another thing that I really like by having the top of this be an open slot. And so I know this can be like an aesthetic thing for some people, but if you have this style of clip, it can be a little finicky trying to get the tip of your bit driver in through here and keep the screw on it so it doesn't fall off, it can just be a little bit hard to access that. So by having this be an open cavity, it's gonna be a lot easier to get these screws actually in for disassembly or reassembly. And you can see that this is a fully reversible clip, so we do have a little insert on the other side to fill that space up. You know, you could take this off. This looks like this is just here to fill that gap. So if you don't mind having that gap, you could have that out. One of the things that has always a little bit bugged me about these filler tabs is that people never make them the same material as the scale itself. 
And I get that because there's different kinds of scale. We'll talk about that in later. That's one of the coolest things about this is the interchangeable scales. But I get that because of that, you would need to have a separate insert for every scale set. But to me, I think this would just look better. I think this is true of literally every knife with a tab insert. It would just look better if this was the same material as the rest of the scale. It would just kind of blend in more. But instead, people tend to make them out of metal. And the thing I will say is that I love that it's here in the first place. Because you can see here on the baby banter, there's just this open slot. And while I've gotten used to this because of how common it is to find these in knives, I don't love them. They're just crisp corners. It just feels incomplete to me. So having the little filler tab there, that I, I, I very, very strongly prefer that. And it's also just nice to see that this is something you can swap over to lefties. Man, the action on that is so good. That closes so easily, flicks so good. I don't have any problem getting to this thumb stud. So what you have here is a gap right there. So you can push down on the side of this a pretty decent amount. And then there's these kind of like tiered grip points on the top. And that does actually provide a pretty good amount of grip. Yeah, that, that definitely catches you. It's interesting to see that these ones are tooled. Like over here on the baby banter, these, uh, I, I don't know, you could probably grip these with like pliers to take them off or something like that. They might be press fit in, I honestly don't know. But you would definitely mar them up for sure, if not completely ruin them in that process. And so the fact that these can come off with a, it looks like a T6. That means that if for some reason you hated these studs, you could certainly replace them. Also, if something happened to them, I'm, I'm pretty sure you could get spares, but also it means that you could just put on your favorite kind of studs if you have a, a really strong preference there. On the backside, you definitely have less access because that, that this show side right here is recessed for that lock bar access, but that's also giving you more access to the, the studs. And so like I said, you can push on the side back here. That's a lot harder to do from the back. So if you are a lefty, you're gonna have a slight disadvantage there. But this is the kind of knife, if you look at the way that this is positioned, this thumb stud is pretty far in and it's low down enough that really the motion you're wanting to do is pretty much upward. So a little bit to the left, but mostly upward. And so you're not really trying to flick out like this in the first place. You wanna be pushing up like that. And that's how you're getting such a good whack because not only do you have a, a firm detent but your motion and all of the follow-through of your flick is in the direction you want to be flicking and so if you are trying to flick from behind or if you're a lefty you're going to want to do that same thing where you kind of push up can i do that i'm not very skilled with my left hand for thumb flicking ah yeah that was tremendously easy but if you're trying to do the reverse flick i'm just gonna it's the same kind of suggestion you want to come from below and push upward like that you're not trying to hold it out and flick out like this you're cant the entire knife in your hand like that and flick up and it's super easy to do. You know, I just noticed that there's jimping right here. Ooh, that's well done. Ooh, I like that a lot. So this is a style of jimping that's really shallow. And so your finger simply cannot push into these jimping points deep enough that it hurts at all. So this is the kind of thing that you can push really firmly on, but it doesn't hurt. But this is crisp enough that this gives me really, really nice traction there. Now, like most of the time on jimping, I wish it was a little bit further forward. So I would like this if it's extended maybe twice as far because this works and it hits my hand only if I have the entire thing kind of angled forward like this and this kind of grip. And that's not a grip that I often cut in. I usually have this canted back more, in which case my thumb is landing up here past that. It's interesting to me also that this jimping is so well done when this jimping is not. This is smooth and just kind of uncomfortable but not actually catching my finger. Okay, let's get to one of the coolest parts about this knives, the scales. And if you're buying this from this exclusive version from RVDC, yeah, those are freaking awesome. I love Sagai Highway Pattern. So one of the things that makes this knife really stand out is the fact that it has hot swappable scales. Now, if you're familiar with Three Rivers Manufacturing, that's a concept you're already familiar with. The whole concept here is that you can take these scales off without having to fully disassemble the knife. On most knives, even ones with full liners, it's the same screws that are holding the scales on top of those liners that is holding the entire knife together. And what Three Rivers did, they're not the only people that have ever done this, but they're the ones that kind of pioneered this and certainly the ones that popularized this idea. They made it so that the liners are holding the knife together already. They're, they're screwed in together underneath the scales. And so if you take the liner off, it kind of, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's effectively like a, a very, very slender frame lock. Now they always tell you not to use it without the 
scales. It's something they push strongly from a safety perspective. But the point here is that you you can take the scales off without having to worry about dealing with something like blade centering or having to relube things or just you know bearings running around. And so it's just so so much faster and easier to swap a new pair of scales on. One of the things that makes it really cool is that it kind of opens up a whole new market where you can buy a bunch of different kinds of scales and you can really easily swap them out and make the knife feel like a totally new knife. This one right here has titanium scales on it, but I've got a whole drawer full of different scales in various different materials, different colors that make the knife feel wildly different. And you can also get aftermarket scales from people like Matt Anderson. Like this is a set of gorgeous, oh, Burlwood scales. These are just so freaking beautiful. And Match made these himself specifically to fit these knives. Now, for the most part, Match had to figure this out on his own, but the folks at TRM are pretty open and they actually did share some schematic details with Match to make sure that he was able to get these in exactly the right spot. And they've been very, very encouraging of folks like Match doing this. The one caveat is that they ask people to not directly compete with them. So they're asking folks to not, for example, make a, a titanium scale that is effectively the same as this, or a G10 scale that is effectively the same as the one that they sell. They, they don't want you to directly compete with their own product, but if you wanna make your own titanium scales, you wanna make your own G10 scales, as long as it's your own unique thing and doing something different to it, they're all for it. And so people have made some really cool aftermarket scales. Now, Ben has taken that same idea here and brought it to the lander. And in a way, he's done it even further. We'll talk about in just a moment what I mean by that. But I want to clear up something right off the bat of like that kind of TRM connection. So Ben has said publicly that this is exactly where the inspiration came from and that he contacted TRM to ask for their blessing before doing this. And unfortunately, TRM said they'd prefer if he didn't. But after a lot of thinking about it and talking with a lawyer, he decided to do it anyway. Now, you know, that's going to give some people some mixed feelings. Now, I personally love TRM. They're my favorite knife company, and they're part of the reason why this channel exists in the first place. And so I definitely want all the best things for them. And I'm assuming that they're thinking about this hot swappable scales as like part of their identity and part of their competitive advantage. And so I can understand why they would prefer if, if he didn't. But at the same time, this isn't something that they have like a patent on or something like that. And so I can also completely understand why Ben knew he could do this anyway. Like from a legal perspective, he can do it. But I also want to make an argument that I'm actually really glad that he did anyway. Because as much as I want TRM to succeed, this concept of hot swappable scales is something that I just think, I think should become mass market. I, I want this to be something that everyone does because it's just such a better way of doing it that's so much easier for an end consumer and just makes it so much more fun as a fan of a, of a particular brand to be able to collect different ways and make that knife stretch out further in your collection and feel totally different. And so like I would much prefer if TRM had said, yeah, go for it from the get-go. And on one hand, I Part of me would prefer if, you know, when they said no thanks, that Ben had said, okay, I guess I won't. But at the same time, honestly, I'm really glad that Ben did. And I want, I, I personally would want every company to follow suit. This is something that everyone should do. And especially folks like Ben. Because Ben, if you followed his banter, you know that he has things like the crazy space kitty scales he can put on. But that you have to take apart the entire knife. And so, yes, you can buy Space Kitty scales for this, and you only have to take out these screws in order to swap that on, and you don't have to take, disassemble the rest of the knife. And at this point, he's got a whole wide variety of scales available. And that's, so this is the first place where Ben is taking this even a little bit further than TRM, is that he's selling aftermarket scales from other makers directly on NAFS.com. So not only can you buy them from other folks, but he's making NAFs kind of like a public marketplace for third-party scales. That's amazing. And also a really smart idea because it means presumably that price involves some amount of margin for him too. Like he's making money that way, but he takes it even a step further. And the, the schematics for the scales themselves are open source. He's released them in both an STL and STP file format. So if you are someone that has a 3D printer or any other kind of CNC controlled thing and are familiar with those 3D CAD files, you can create your own. He has two different versions. He's got one that's true to the specs of the production version. And then he has also one that's been loosened up slightly for 3D printing because certain kinds of filament when you're 3D printing tend to shrink a little bit when cooling. And so some people gave him feedback that they were having tall 
tolerance issues where things were kind of making a compression fit and wouldn't quite fit. So he has a looser version if you were planning on 3D printing. But the other thing is it's open source, which means that you can tweak it yourself. Like if you find that whatever your printer setup is means that it won't quite work for you, you can tweak it however you need to. And like I said, it's open sourced under a Creative Commons license, which means you not only can make your own versions, you can sell your own versions. All you have to do is give attribution for the file to NAFS. And that, that is huge. Because it lowers the barrier entry for folks making aftermarket scales dramatically, and it gives them legal permission to do so. And that is so huge. In a time when you have folks like Benchmade suing third-party scale makers, ugh, this is the exact opposite. And I love, love, love to see that. Okay, let's do it right now and swap on these gorgeous Sagaiha scales. I should have done this at the beginning so I had these on the entire time. You need a T6 here, I believe. This, by the way, is my favorite bit driver. If you're gonna have a single bit driver, this thing is amazing. It's perfect kind of grip and also stores all the bits you need right there. This is from Griffin Co, AKA Combat Beads. And this is the MK2 driver. By the way, um, you can get these directly from him, but I also picked up another one of these from Urban EDC. So they do have those there from time to time too. Okay, so we're gonna have to remove these two screws here that hold on the scale and these two screws here that hold on this little plate here. So this is another reason why you might leave it off and just leave your little gap right there is if you don't want to have to take off these other two screws. I'm going to have the same issue on the back because those same screws need to be removed to take out the clip. So it's basically equivalent on both sides. I'm having no trouble with this whatsoever and these don't feel soft to me. So either they have addressed the soft screw problem that Shabazz talked about, or I'm just getting lucky, or it's a, uh, a factor of the fact that this is a premium version. Now it is worth noting that these screws and these screws are different. These screws for the body are these ones with this little kind of chubby mushroom shape, where it's, where it's flat here at the top. And these ones, in order to make it be countersunk like that, these ones have to have a like an angled side of the top. So just make sure that you keep those two sets separately. And just like that, this comes right off. And this is where you can see how I'm saying that the liner is being held together even without that. These screws hold this together and make it function and maintain things like your pivot tension and your centering without anything to do with this scale. So we can swap on this new one. It's as easy as placing it down and putting those screws back in. So let's put those in. This one stayed in that little clip part, so let's just pop that in. That's so easy, and now we have these amazing scales on it. I'm gonna do the backside too, and I'll just not talk during it so I can put it on 10x speed or something like that. Now this is where I'm going to show you what I mean by fitting these in and how it's easier to do. Now, I, what I typically do for not, things like this is I tend to put the screw on the tip of the bit. And then I put the clip where it needs to be. And then I kind of hold it up into that last moment and push through. And because this gap is so big, I don't have to worry about canting this in any direction. I don't have to worry about it getting knocked off by the spot in the middle. And it's really easy to insert that. Let's do that one more time. See how I can come in at an angle here, fit this in. Yeah, that's just so much easier. Okay, now we have these beautiful waves on both front and back. So I will say that the scales that came on it are still worth having and you're going to want these as well because they are contoured and that just feels really, really nice in your hand. So let's see how much of a difference it makes having the flat scales on. Oh yeah, you definitely can feel it. These don't feel bad at all, but I just always prefer a contoured scale where I can get it. But Oh, this feels amazing. This is a wonderful level of grip. This is probably done with lasers. That's my guess. And it's just deep enough that it provides a really nice level of traction, but it's not, it's not like aggressive. And because these are all going at different angles, it's not like when you slide this in your pocket that your pants are going to be going against like some kind of toothy edge and hold them in place. This will still slide pretty easily. And it feels, oh, yeah, it's, this is that extra level of grip. So this is both like form and function right there. And it's that fun kind of 
crazy Sagaiha pattern that they do some of the time that I just find aesthetically really fun. Some people really love the kind of repetitive nature of the standard Sagaiha motif, you know, something like you'll find right there, but other folks find that a little bit monotonous. And so this style where they're kind of skewed and coming at all angles really spices that up. And you still get a similar aesthetic, but with a lot more visual intrigue. These are so cool. And like I said, I was able to swap those and not impact the action whatsoever. Okay, so quick update. So I mentioned how if you swap these scales, you don't end up messing your pivot tension, you don't end up messing with your centering, anything like that. So that means if you dial this in perfectly, you're not going to mess that up by changing the scales. Well, this uh, I noticed that most knives tend to come to me just a little bit tighter than they need to. And so this one was already pretty well tuned when it came, but all I did was back this pivot out just, you know, like maybe like a 16th of a turn. And now there, this has like really nice free fall action if I pull this lock bar away and but still absolutely zero blade play and so now it does the fall to my nail thing perfectly which by the way it hits right about there so the way that I tend to drop to the nail where I'm holding my thumb upward I'm landing on the the, the unsharpened part of that blade and then the entire thing wow that closes easily That's awesome. Okay, let's talk about price here. These, like I said, are dropping this Wednesday and they're going to be $149. So let's talk about that price. What does that mean? So like I said, you can buy aftermarket scales on NAFS.com directly and there's a whole bunch of varieties. There's different materials. There's all sorts of printed patterns. There's even some with 3D textural patterns like this, not this particular one, but things kind of in this ballpark. And they range anywhere from 20 to 75 bucks, depending on who's making them and how complicated they are. And the kind of textural ones that are done in G10, those are about 40 bucks. So if this is 150 and you take out 40 bucks, you're looking at like about $110. How does that compare to the regular version? Now the D2 with flat G10, but without any fancy texturing to it, that's I think 58. And if you bump yourself up to 14C28N, which is, by most people's standards, a much better budget steal. Now you're looking at $80. So that's about a $20 jump to go from that flat G10 and D2 to 14C28N and the contoured micarta. So going from 80 up to 110 for let's say these with the things that came on originally, that means you're taking about a $30 price jump to go from 14C20N, which is a, no one's confused, it's a budget steal. It's, it's a great budget steal, but it's a budget steal all the way up to M390, which is a premium super steel. Now, I don't know what the hardness is going to be on M390. I don't think I've really experienced M390 from QSP, so I don't really know what the reputation is for it, but it's a steel that is capable of excellent edge retention, excellent corrosion resistance, just like a really well-balanced modern super steel. And so for a lot of people, that extra 30 bucks is gonna be worth it. And then how do these scales compare to the other ones that you can buy there? I can tell you right now, None of them have Sagaiha. I think it's probably gonna stay that way as part of the collaboration they're doing here. And they certainly don't have this particular Sagaiha pattern, which is, I believe, an exclusive to Urban ADC. And these are so nicely done. And so if you are the type of person that is super excited every time Urban ADC comes out with a new collaboration because you can get it in Sagaiha, well, this is the only way you're gonna be able to find that. I know that it's also coming in a green handle and I think that's coming with a like a dark washed blade. And for that, it's going to be green for both the uh, contoured and the Sagaiha. And so you do have that option as well. I think in my like ideal scenario, I'd probably have the green handle on the satin blade and that'd probably like the most me aesthetic. But these look fantastic. And something that I really like is that these are effectively sand colored and that just plays in so nicely with the wave motif because it just feels like like the beach. The other thing is that this is a light enough color of G10 that if you are the ambitious type, you could certainly writ dye these. And while it wouldn't writ dye as well as something that's like white, although how often do you find white G10? It exists, but like the stormtrooper kind. And I think it would take color really, really well, and you wouldn't you wouldn't notice that it had a tan base for the most part. It would probably be pretty true to the color. 
just maybe a little bit darker. And it's certainly going to be better than trying to dye something like OD green or dye red to blue or something silly like that. These would dye pretty well. So my own feeling about that is that this price feels fine to me. You know, this is something I, I literally unboxed right now. So I, I don't know if these are gonna hold up for a whole bunch of uses or if I'm gonna have similar stripping issues that Shabazz mentioned, but these don't feel soft from like, normally you can tell right away whether or not there's crisp engagement. I don't know. So this version here in my hands today feels well done and is up to my expectations of the kind of quality that I know QSP can do in the budget space. So I think this is an incredibly cool collaboration and I think it's gonna to appeal to a lot of people. So if this is appealing to you, these are coming out on Wednesday. I'm super glad I got to check one out. So thank you guys for watching. Huge thank you to Ben and Urban EDC for sending this my way and I'll catch you guys next time.